We were a little bit late, but I'm Tim, this is Watch It Tonight, and we are ready to go. Thanks to all of you who stayed with me. I am glad to see Joe Pinto, Rich M, Thomas B, Kevin H, Soft Drinks of Choice, Dave, and Slow Boy. Watch Obsession, AD, Abdul, Joe T, Amick in Florida. Welcome and thank you for bearing with us. This evening, we window shop a brand you'd never imagine I would love, chat live, and I share your wrist shots right here tonight on Watches Tonight. We also discuss whether Rolex, yes, Rolex, is Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, or Lexus? Let's find out. But first, if you enjoy this program, check me out on Instagram. Updated several times a week, more than once a day, it is the short form version of Watchbox Reviews. 60 second hits, as many as you can handle. You can binge watch my collection of quick reviews of the coolest watches I find in our safe. That's Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. Bobby G, Aunt G, Herb, welcome. Tommy L, we got Fabian joining in, and Bill Lyles, Mirrored A, he of the Anglage, and we got Zikrit joining in from Norway, staying up late with us in Northern Continental Europe. Oh great, a few of yours on mine. Viewers chats number one, starting off with Tim M. No, not me, the other Tim M, Tim Mancuso, who leads off with his rare Cartier Calibre de Cartier Full Gold, which he bought from the 1916 company, so thank you for trusting our company. Mark S. His Vacheron Overseas Ultra Thin and Porsche Taycan hit the road. Thor and his vintage Submariner 5513-1963 roll with the 1967 Corvette Stingray. I love that guy. Chris L and his Ming 2702 keep pace in his BMW 1M, a watch that was, well, a classic with a car that was, well, a classic, both from the beginning. Chaitanya K and his Rolex Sea Dweller 43 50th Anniversary Red hit the water for the first time. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Who else is in the box here? Toby Talks Cars greeting us from Zurich, staying up late there too. We've got Andrew T saying hello, hello Andrew, and David Gonzalez have got the day off, so getting to watch live for a change. Who knows, maybe the delayed start will actually give us a larger audience tonight. It's something of a niche topic, but Sid did a great job of loading a very demanding slide, so stick around for the show. It's going to be worth your while. First, is Rolex Lexus, Mercedes-Benz, or Toyota? Here's a thought while we file in. I recently read a forum post that compared Rolex to Toyota. And while I appreciate the intent here, both are reliable and well-engineered, Rolex, unlike Toyota, is luxury. That's quite clear. So the question becomes, which luxury car embodies the most Rolex-like values? Lexus, which is Toyota's luxury brand, it seems like a perfect match to me. And here's my reasoning. Like Lexus, Rolex has a more affordable junior brand in Tudor. Tudor handles the point of entry to the world of Rolex. From that point, you move up to Rolex, just as you move up from Tudor to Rolex, or at least as Rolex would have it happen. And Lexus, like Rolex, is known for reliability, consistency, and longevity. Most of its models evolve slowly, endure in the catalog for a long time, and are considered nearly default options for well-heeled people in the mainstream volume luxury marketplace. Mercedes, in contrast, had some first-hand experience with one of those W210s back in the 90s, and I can tell you, it abandoned its Rolex-like commitment to conservative design and bulletproof engineering, starting in about the mid-90s with that generation of E-Class. This was the Jürgen Tremp era, and it was not a good time. It was also the era of Daimler Chrysler, which, contrary to most assumptions, had less to do with Chrysler taking over Mercedes and more to deal with the sort of uber-Chrysler mentality taking control of both through Jürgen Tremp and his immediately controlled underlings. It was a bad time for Daimler and Chrysler, but particularly for the world's oldest automotive brand. By the time the qualitative catastrophes of the Jürgen Tremp era were banished for good, MB had lost its sheen of invincibility and peerless engineering supremacy. Lexus, though, never had an era when its products became infamous for design lapses, and neither has Rolex. Rolex has actually gotten better with time, though never being disappointing in any era, it has always been mainstream quality and never really something that disappoints based on prior performance. The Rolex of the 40s 
was inferior to the Rolex of the 50s, which was inferior to the Rolex of the 60s, and so on. Progress. You never got the sense that the Rolex of like the 90s was worse than the Rolex of the 80s. Mercedes, that was a problem. Now, once in a generation, here's the thing. Mercedes launches absurd vehicles for which Rolex has no real equivalence. Um, Mercedes also plays at price points that feel like the core equivalent of Richard Mille, Grubel Forcey, or Roger Dubuis. Again, Rolex doesn't really go there. Rolex, when it does do something crazy, the sole reason is usually some sort of handcrafted gem set special that occupies the slot. It's usually something that's not even in the catalog, isn't advertised, and has to be asked for specifically. Not a crazy complication or bespoke edition. Now, once in a generation, Lexus will create a nutty vehicle that would be remembered for decades. It's special precisely because it is such a departure for the brand. And that's exactly what Rolex did in 2022 with the Deep Sea Challenge, a 50 millimeter titanium behemoth sealed to over 36,000 feet. It was the first Rolex diver of such ambition since the 1960s in the Deep Sea Special. And yet, between Lexus and Mercedes, I have to admit, I still want the Benz more. I'm drawn to the maintenance disasters like the C215, especially the supercharged, e or, well, not that one. That's not the C215, that is right there. Especially the supercharged CL55 version. I know what a disaster it is to run. I know it costs $10,000 to fix basic things. And I also like costly to run, but well-engineered emerging classics like the W140. Now we can cut back to the S-Class Coupe. So I often find Mercedes-Benz more interesting than Lexus, even though Lexus this makes a better car. So you might ask, which company is the watchmaking Mercedes-Benz with a record of high highs and low lows, but almost everything quite interesting in between? Here's a clue. Although oddly, uh, that guy right there is no longer with Mercedes-Benz. Circa 2025, he's going to be with Ferrari, and I'm looking forward to it. But for now, you know who he sponsors or who sponsors him. Viewerist shots number two, Daniel S. And his 1916 bought IWC Pilot's Watch chronograph, Overlook Manhattan. Looking good, and thank you for trusting our company. Professor Adrian and his Zenith Chronomaster Original experiment with some new straps, and I think it's a victory. Dan R. and his IWC Portuguese 40, Weather Winter at Niagara on the Lake, Ontario, Canada. Chase L. and his Parmigiani Fleurier Classic share a quiet moment. William R. shares his uncommon GPHG Laureate Siga Design Blue Planet. Guys, keep them coming. Wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on my box. And that probably won't be applicable too much longer because very soon everything will be the 1916 company. So I'll need to come up with something new. Mason One saying, ah, there you are. I'd given up hope that this live stream was happening. Hi there, Tim from the UK. 1916 bought Moser Pioneer Swiss Mad Red with bracelet on the wrist tonight. Again, thank you for trusting the 1916 company. I think in time we'll call it 1916. We have Renside, who's tardy. That's okay. You're just in time for our main feature. Abdul R saying, Hamilton 44 in red will be epic in 2025. I agree. And also, because he's going to have a really cool teammate. For the first time since Jensen Button and Nico Rosberg, Hamilton's going to have real in-house competition. Well, we have uh, Brian Essing, David Kendo, thoughts, Tim. I would say buy a David Kendo watch made by someone else, like the JLC Master Minute Repeater, because they'll provide parts and service. I like Kendo, but he's a controversial guy. When buying a watch from him, consider it like commissioning art from a high-ceiling high reward, high risk type of artist. Um, again, research his business history, know what you're getting into. He's a very nice guy, a very capable watchmaker, but whenever you're dealing with someone who makes very few watches on a craft basis and has had successes and failures as a businessman, you really want to understand the risk that you're taking. What else is going on? I'm in Florida saying, Tim, I loved your Omega Caliber 321 unboxing. Guys, keep me streaming. Open up a new window after this. Check out my unboxing of the Ed White over on Watchbox Reviews. Okay, my six watch mono brand collection, guys. This is a dream watch collection of mine, and I'm gonna 
solicit your feedback on these picks. They are ultimately very personal, but I'd love to hear your reaction since you wouldn't expect that I would be a mono brand collector of this company. But fact, I was a mono brand collector for eight years with Giger Le Coult. Part of the reason, and that's my old collection right there, was my admiration for the brand itself, its history, and I perceived it to be just a brand with integrity. Despite being in a corporate group, it didn't seem to have compromised itself yet with cheapened watches or too many watches or watches that were coming back on warranty, at least at that point, back in 2015. The fantastic back catalog of JLC models left me with near limitless choices. Any watch I could imagine, they made at some point and I could stay within the family. Today, I revealed that once again, I've envisioned a mono brand collection from a company within the Richemont fold. Unlike my attraction to JLC, my attraction to this new suitor is purely a function of its back catalog. I'm agnostic on its past, its present, the people running it, the heritage, or what may be deemed to be its traditions. I simply love some of these watches. And here goes. I'm not a forum groupie, a fanboy, a brand purist, or even a current owner of a single reference, and I'm not an aggrieved brand absolutist like a certain John Mayer. That's right, guys, I'm building the IWC collection of my dreams today, and we're going where no episode of Watches Tonight has gone before. Let's start with my favorite recent IWC, the watch that let me know they still have a pulse in the modern era, and it's not just the John Mayer approved references from the pre georges current era that are cool. Possibly the coolest watch made by anyone in 2018, the 2018 Tribute to Paul Weber, edition 150 years. Now here's your proof that Mayer may have spoken too soon about modern IWC. Based on the IWC Joseph Paul Weber digital display pocket watches that came out starting about 1884, or 100 years before I was born, the 2018 limited edition of 500 pieces in steel was less than, well, I think it was less than one third the price of a Zeitwerk at the time, and really just as formidable. That is an actual enamel dial Paul Weber that was at SIHH in 2018. They had a watchmaker working on these. She was very cool, and the watches were awesome. I rarely bother to get personal wrist shots of a display watch at a show, but this one was an exception. I had to see how it fit, because at 46 millimeters, I kind of thought and hoped that it was off limits. No dice, this thing actually fits well on a small wrist. I knew I had to have this gorgeous thing sooner or later. Marvel here, at 12 layers, of hand-polished blue and clear lacquer. It's designed to look like vintage enamel. Instantaneous jumping minutes and hours. And yes, the seconds hand is synchronized to the minutes, even though they're driven by two separate mainspring barrels. We have an exclusive caliber 94200, manual wind, 60 hours of power reserve. This movement was never used on any other IWC series, meaning it is a rare exclusive build, expensively constructed for a super scarce limited edition. That's not the kind of thing that accountants would approve, which makes me suspect that there were still some very soulful watchmakers and designers working on this project. Ah, uh, here's the thing too, twin barrels. Take a look there, you can see two barrels, two drive trains. So with one barrel to drive the balance and the seconds hand, you don't have the drop off in amplitude or fluctuation in amplitude that you normally get with a jumping time watch, allowing it to pull off the same trick as the Zeitwerk, albeit without the expensive and complex Remontoir Constant Force system. Plus, unlike the at the time 36 hour Zeitwerk power reserve, this one was 60 and a good looking movement over 36 millimeters in diameter, properly sized for the case. It was made in steel, platinum, and rose gold. There was also a rose gold hunter-cased pocket watch, but the 2018 star was that steel model with the blue dial. And again, 45, 46 millimeters, it's sort of between them, but essentially lugless at a thin 11.9 millimeters. It's probably in the top five or six watches I'd own if I won the lottery. So I'm not qualifying this choice by price or practicality in any way. It's not a concession. Now, Chrono 24, if we look at the real world, has them listed between about $22,000 and $30,000. Realistically, because we've had a couple, you're going to pay somewhere around $22,000, $23,000 for one of these. Full box papers unpolished. Uh, I am not alone in my admiration for this one. The original retail price was $23,100, making it a rare modern IWC that really hasn't lost a cent of value. Hey, what can I say? Fans know and fans know. Let's take a look what you guys know. 
Cam saying, IWC Mark 20 or Rolex Oyster Perpetual? I'd probably go with the Oyster Perpetual just because there's a lot of fun dials these days. Although I think there is a Mark 20 that has a full loom dial and a ceramic case. So maybe that one, actually. Yeah, I think there is a, what is it, the Black Aces model, I want to say, that has the full loom dial. And then we've got Brendan Cunningham saying, that is a fantastic watch choice, great choice, Tim. All right. Uh, by the way, you need to check out Brendan Cunningham's watch blog, uh, Horolonomics, where he reviews all sorts of factors relevant to both economics and watch collecting. He's a big Rolex fan and a published Rolex historian, and he is also a PhD in economics. So Brendan Cunningham, check it out. His blog is top notch. Jim Millett saying, the original 5002 Big Pilot is still my favorite IWC. I'm a huge fan of the rarely seen Marcus Bueller, not the re-edition, the first one. Very cool to see a watchmaking apprentice get a grant to build his dream watch and sell it through a major Richemont company. The original Marcus Bueller, I want to say it was the 5003 reference. A cool turbine dial, Unitas powered Big Pilot. What else is going on here? Swiss Tran 2000, Swiss Tristan 2000 saying, I wish IWC would do a Mark 20 in colorful ceramics. That would be cool. Like Hublot colorful, not matte colors. We have Chichanya K saying, Tim, finally caught you live after a long time. You're in the show, so welcome. Constantinos saying, joining in from Greece. Thank you for staying up late with us, Constantinos. Okay, now, guys, the fried egg. It may be, you, it may be new to you, but the watch is fresh forever. So along with Vacheron 222, you're looking at my ultimate birth year watch. We don't talk about 80s watchmaking too often. Who knows, maybe there'd be a Rolex Date 8 Tridor in there or an Oyster Quartz Lapis Dial. But right now, I think 1984, I think this. This one has a story that deserves to be told. So we don't talk 80s watchmaking in general, but it was a cool period for IWC. And in 84, this Portofino reference 5251 was a thunderous endorsement of traditional mechanical watchmaking by the people at IWC. Now, this was the peak of the quartz era. It was still the quartz crisis. And there were still crickets in watchmaking schools around Switzerland. It was a good time to be a watchmaking apprentice or student because you'd get the professor all to yourself. Now, here, the mechanical caliber 9521, a pocket watch movement, it was a giant giant, gold gilded, and linked to a moon phase module on the dial side, packaged in that impossibly huge 46 millimeter case. Hey guys, this was an era when in 1985 Patek launched the 3919, a typical gold dress watch that was a standard 33 millimeters. So 46 was colossal, a clock more than a watch. The fried egg earned its nickname with a white enamel dial, kiln fired, and paired with the yellow gold case. It was based on a pocket watch movement and a pocket watch model, albeit here with the design by watchmaking Ace Kurt Klaus, so that was the actual mechanism, and designer Hanno Bircher, who was a prolific designer of IWC's 80s era timepieces. They combined to create this milestone. Now, uh, Venturing Glass Moon Phase Disc. Uh, if this is the fried egg, I guess we've got the whites, we've got the yolk, and that blue aventurine is like a blueberry pancake, I suppose. Caliber 9521 hailed from an era when IWC watchmaking, especially mechanical watchmaking, was low volume and nothing but exhaustive hand finishing was considered for such a flagship piece. And it was one of the earliest sapphire display case back watches from IWC, although a solid case back was dubiously available. Some were made, I can't imagine what they were thinking. Impressive people, like I said, Gunter Blumlein was CEO of IWC at the time, and he blessed this project. He would later go on to revive JLC and be one of the founding fathers of the modern longa. Kurt Klaus, who has been the subject of many tributes from IWC, was still leading from the front at the time, the watchmaking head of IWC's mechanical watchmaking department, and this was his baby. We had Hanno Bircher, who 
designed many period IWCs that are iconic among IWC collectors today. His original version of this watch had Louis XV hands, which were really weird, but the ultimate design is still very close to his original concept, meaning this one was born from a concept watch almost undiluted, something rare in the business. Finally, marketing director Hannes Pantley, who is also the co-father, or godfather if you will, of the Gerald Genta Ingenieur back in the 60s, he was responsible for the idea here and the Portofino nomenclature. While the watch is obscure, its influence to drive the design of today's Portofino is still self-evident. You could still see the design indoors in the collection today. And although the fried egg was available from the early 80s through the late 1990s, few were ordered due to the extreme price and extreme size. Consensus seems to be that a few hundred were made, and today the model retails respectably as a twenty to twenty-five thousand dollar timepiece in the vintage class. The earliest examples, early 80s. The latest examples, late 90s. Meaning this watch spans the quartz crisis to almost the modern era. By the best one you can find, hold on to it like dear life and never sell. Okay, 1985 was a big year for IWC as the landmark Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar Chronograph launched at the Basel Watch and Jewelry Fair. And it was pretty much 50-50 back then, watches and jewelry. At 39 millimeters in diameter with a plexiglass crystal to clear its mountain of overlapping hands. This watch was a marvel at the time. Its distinctive lugs, Vendome style, were once again Bircher's work, and the final watch remained remarkably true to his original vision, shown here in an IWC archival image, that guy could sketch. But that's not the watch I want, nope. I want the ultimate version of this series, which arrived 14 years later as the 3752, the Da Vinci Perpetual Calendar Tourbillon chronograph, caliber 76061, face melting based on the manual wine value 7760, and this had immense modifications, bridges, train, power source, regulator, finish, almost nothing but the train geometry of the value was kept. Here we have a chronograph a Kurt Klaus mechanically programmed sequential perpetual calendar, an adventuring glass moon phase disc, a case back tourbillon, and yes, you can see it is a flying tourbillon. Take a look at the upper left hand corner there. The century slide is actually stored in a visible slot on the case back. When the time comes, your IWC watchmaker will swap that to the dial side of the timepiece. You've got the 23rd, 24th, and 25th centuries ready to go. Take a look at lower center. Here we have a flying tourbillon, escapement regulator, carriage entirely built by IWC. They also used an overcoil hairspring. So this was a case back flying tourbillon. Not just their own construction, but the ultimate in discretion. I wish every tourbillon were this discreet. As recently as 2019, they were selling for an almost farcical amount of money. That thing auctioned for about $17,500. And look at it, it's got the full box paper. This is a perpetual calendar chronograph flying tourbillon, guys, in precious metal. And keep in mind what people were paying for steel Rolex Daytonas even then. Now, Chrono 24 prices are still relative values for a completely handmade and decorated limited edition mega complication. Up there, like left center at the top, you can see the ultra scarce 20 piece gold dial and hand engraved Da Vinci Four Seasons variant engraved in-house by IWC. Even this looks reasonably priced compared to what say an equivalent Patek would cost. This frankly guys is like mid-level BMW 3 Series money for something that will last generations longer. I'd hold out for the rare platinum variant with the blue dial. That one is my dream of dreams. Okay, wrist shots number three. Before we jump in, let's see what you guys are saying down in the box, saying, Time Hill, Tim seems to be attracted to jump hours. Guilty as charged. Mostly jump hours with digital time, but also those that are merely jumping hours, minutes, and seconds. A rare example, Patex 5275, which was not digital time, but was jumping hours, minutes, and seconds. Q 
Kiki Fries saying, nice deal, whoever got that for under $20,000. Felton, is Tudor a brand watch that will last like Rolex? In terms of lasting, yes. Rolex and Tudor watches will last an equal amount of time. Jim Millett saying, IWC have produced some special pieces. JNM saying, hello, Tim and the gang. Welcome, JNM. We got Mojal saying, I would go for the IWC Romana. JLC 849 base movement with Kurt Klaus crown only setting perpetual calendar module. That is a great choice and a rare one. And then we have Jean-Luc saying, good evening from Zurich, Switzerland, and thank you for staying up late with us. We got BNS saying, nice deal, I guess, but I can't imagine any occasion when I'd wear that IWC. Oh, I would wear it proudly. But to each his own. Viewer is shots number three. Eric G and his Tudor Black Bay FXD Black tackle the terrain with the newly launched Lexus GX550 Overtrail. Ben K from Singapore has three times the fun on Lunar New Year 2024. Happy New Year, Ben and brothers. Walter of Miami has a photo of contraband here. I debated whether to even show this, but I show it because it's dimly lit. It is the full tantalum, full tantalum bracelet, blue sapphire set, and that is blue sapphire bezel set, 2023 Louis Vuitton tambour. That is a piece unique. I can't tell you whose, but take my advice. If you want to get one of those, you better call in straight from the top. The full tantalum, sapphire bezel set, LV tambour. Walter, if someone comes from you for sharing that image, it won't be me, and that's the scary part. Brett M and Shelter Dogs appreciate the uncommon Blanc Path 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe 38. Good on you for working at Animal Rescue, and that is a cool and rare modern 50 Fathoms. James F and his Omega Railmaster recover from shoulder surgery with literature. Get well, James. Send your chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see where pieces on these pixels. My six watch collection and your feedback. Let me know what you think, guys. Enough dress watches. Don't I need a water resistant watch? You're right, I sure do. Something that's sporty, full bracelet, tough, and ready to go where gold watches can't. The GST Alarm, reference 3537, is my choice. Launched in 1998 and built through 2003, it was rarely requested, and as a result, every version is uncommon. It was an automatic JLC caliber 916 Memovox, an alarm caliber, automatic winding, and keeps me connected to my old love JLC by means of IWC, with which JLC has been a sister company, either under VDO and then later Richemont since the 1980s. So check out this GST's epic tritium dial fade. That's the real deal, not Fotina. And you can find it on pre-2001 examples. Look at that old vaulted International Watch Co. script. I adore this watch. Being a GST, it was available in gold, steel, and titanium. GST, get it? A full bracelet and 39.9 millimeter diameter produce outstanding fit and swimmable water resistance. Size and fit on a small wrist are superb. The GST alarm also has an internal rotating dive bezel. Quick guys, pop quiz. How many tritium dial JLC powered internal bezel Memovox dive watches can you buy for under seven grand? That's a short list. I've often said that the alarm is my favorite complication with a dive bezel, sleek 1990s IWC design, factory tritium, the vintage and much loved fish style crown, and superb size, I like this model even more. Guys, the 90s rocked and IWC was at the forefront. I never realized how much I need an anti-magnetic watch till I started using newer generations of MacBook. I can literally dump a stack of paper clips on the corner of this, of this MacBook right here, and they will all adhere, every single one of them. I can build like a tower of paper clips because there are huge permanent magnets under my keyboard for those speakers. And they constantly magnetize my watches, all of them, even my old Zinn. I have to deal with watches that are often running minutes fast for 24 hours, so I'm constantly demagging my watches. I've got a demag at home. The 2023 IWC Ingenieur could be the solution to that. The green dial variant right here might seem like a predictable ploy given the green dial epic that coincided roughly with the pandemic years, but look closer and you can see this is more of a metallic teal than true green and I really love that. 
The pattern of the landmark Gerald Genta IWC Ingenieur SL 1832 clearly returns in the best Ingenieur launch in years. We had too many late 2010s Ingenieurs rooted in the 1950s, and frankly they were a bit anodyne and boring. But the definitive Ingenieur from the 1970s was unceremoniously flushed from the catalog. Some have blamed IWC designer Christian Knopp as being somewhat averse to designs not penned under his aegis, but that's just speculation. Now this was all hugely ironic since IWC genuinely has a 1970s Gerald Genta designed Pure Watch to the Nautilus and Royal Oak designed in the same purple patch that Genta designed those watches in the first place. Now today, everyone from Vempe to Moser is trying to gloam onto the integrated bracelet sports watch fad, but IWC left the real deal dying on the scrap heap. Now with a 40 millimeter case, 100 meter water resistance, an anti-magnetic soft iron inner shield, an integrated steel bracelet to fit it to the wrist, and a five day automatic winding power reserve, what's not to love here? Well. Frankly, how about the price? At $11,700 for the steel model and a breathtaking $14,600 in titanium, IWC's management has lost touch with reality. Now, it's a good watch, but it's not 14,600 good. Keep in mind that the exact same Valfleurier movement is used across the Richemont group, including in a Balm and Mercier Clifton that costs $3,450. And that one is COSC certified as a chronometer. The IWC isn't. Although I'm sure the IWC is adjusted just as well. Still, given where you can find that movement, IWC should seriously consider selling that engineer for under 10 grand. The case and the bracelet and the dial do not explain the premium, not to my satisfaction. Finally, we have a watch that's more than my IWC grail. It might be my exit watch and my grail of grails. Head to head with a Debitune DBD, this one would come down to the wire, a fight to the finish. Bloody knuckles and chins and noses on both sides. I can't honestly tell you who would win. Let's see what you guys are saying right here. Chitanya saying, Ingenieur, love it, but too expensive. Would get a VC56 for that price or even a Yachtmaster 40 blue dial. For the price of the titanium Ingenieur, you could almost get a Cade Allele in steel with Geneva Hallmark and the later 100 meter case. Jim Millett saying, great to see some members of the Archieverse on here. We do have Archie fans. We got... Right here, Mason 1 saying to me that looks like the color often referred to as petrol. A little bit maybe. Patronas teal, maybe? Patronas teal? We, since we were on the Mercedes AMG kick earlier on. And then right here we have James F saying the five top bolts throw me off. And Ron H late but made it from Sydney, Australia. You're getting up early with me. I like that. We have William B saying, Hello from Valparaiso, Indiana in the great American Midwest, one of the original motor states of American automaking. Julius C. saying Baum and Mercier is underrated. True. We'll talk more about them hopefully next week. But first, the IWC Grand Complication, reference 3770. Ugh, that watch. Perfect. I'm done. Sign me up. Launched in 1990 and built with few changes for 20 years, it was the ultimate IWC when launched. Even today, with the exception of Il Destriero Scafusia and the Sidereal Scafusia, the Grand Comp sits at the top of Schaffhausen's Olympus. At 42.2 millimeters in diameter, it was huge for 1990, but remarkably wearable by today's absurd mega complication standards. It's a big watch, but it's not a brick on the wrist. It doesn't feel like it's going to devour your forearm like the blob. I've worn it. And as a result of having worn it, I know that it fits. And I have photo evidence. Case closed. This one, no, not that one. That's the absurd oversized watch. There we go. There we go. Can we see that over the top shot again? Making up for lost time there. The flat plane, the down the barrel. There we go. That thing fits me. Game on, like I said. So, 
This is my Grand, the Platinum Black Dial model. It's known as the Dash 17. So Platinum case, black dial, and an alligator leather strap. I might dress it up with a custom strap, but otherwise, this is perfect. Th this, this is all I need. Caliber 79091 is a monster, and it is based on the 7750. Unlike the tourbillon you saw before, this one's still automatic winding. The 79091 has 76 joules. Remember, a standard 7750 has 25. IWC went to town building this movement. The design of the case is Hanno Bircher. The design of the perpetual calendar is Kurt Klaus. The design of the minute repeater module is a pre Audemar Piguet Renault Papi. This is like an anthology of the best of Swiss watchmaking from the period. The movement has 657 pieces, and because it's IWC and it's a 7750 base, it's going to be serviceable forever, and it's tough enough to wear every day. You better believe I would. You may ask, what is a Grand Complication? I've seen very complicated watches that are not a Grand Complication. Well, traditionally, it's a pocket watch chronograph. In the pocket watch era, it wouldn't have been a split a minute repeater, and a perpetual calendar. Today we often say split second chronograph, minute repeater, and perpetual calendar, but I still go by the pocket watch traditional definition of chrono, perpetual, and minute repeater. This has got all of them and that adventuring glass moon phase. The market is surprisingly restrained given the rarity and the exotic features, but I'm not complaining. If I can get one of these a hundred grand someday, when I have fabulous 1916 company millions, I'll be very happy. But this is my one watch collection forever. And yes, I could be satisfied with just that one watch. Okay, see so what you guys are saying. Dealer Ignition wasn't late on my other watch's time schedule. Robert Wood, hello everyone. I'm late and I don't blame you. Yuki Sonoda saying, people here are cool with Tiso. Don't know if you can make people here like them as you do on the other stream. Maybe we talk about budget watches next week. Bomb and Mercier, Tiso, Longine. Chitanya saying, Patek Nautilus white gold 5811 for Tim. I really wish Patek Philippe launched a steel version for that this year. It'll come eventually. Wait till they've exhausted the appetite for platinum, white gold, rose gold, yellow gold. And then we've got Ivar joining in and Von Krul saying that movement instills fear. It goes to the maker for service. Who else would even touch it? Well, I bet you could send it to Richard Hobring and he would service it. But I would say David Walter if Richard Hobring, Hobring would not. Um, and again, IWC is going nowhere. Just send it to them. I, I found their service invoices are actually kind of fair. Viewers shots number four. Darren S. is in Cabo with an uncommonly handsome custom dial Tiso PRX. Jens F. endures a kids football match with his Doxa Sub 300 Shark Hunter Carbon. Mohammed E., his daughter Humaira, her Tudor Black Bay S&G, and a friend explore a reptile cafe in Kuala Lumpur. I'd say maybe wash your hands before eating. And then we have Phil C. Sr. and Jr. displaying the shocking color contrast on two different runs of the same generation of Rolex green sub. Look at the difference in shade of those bezels. Shocking evidence there. Luis R. and his youngins Max Bill prepare to enjoy the Hamburg Elbe Philharmonie. Enjoy the show and thank you for taking us home, Luis. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. By the way, if you are in South Florida at the end of next week, the 29th, perpetual calendar day, the 1st of March or the 2nd, Visit our or email our RSVP at the 1916company.com and visit me at our Generations timeline of FP Journe timepieces. 60 pieces, exotic, rare, and milestone, and I'll be there to give you my first hand impression as a rock contour of Journe history. Until then, time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on, and good job, Sid, for working through some tech problems. He got us there, took a little bit of time, but he overcame the machine. Again, thanks, Sid, thanks to you, and thanks for logging.